Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. My name is Courtney. I am here with my spouse, Royce, and together we are the ace couple. And today, we are asking the question on everybody's mind, is Jessica Rabbit an asexual icon? Is that a question that's on everyone's mind? Everyone's right, mind. Right now? Right this minute. This episode's going to come out and every single one of our subscribers is going to be like, hey, I was just wondering about that. What fortuitous timing that they're talking about it now. <laughs> so before last night, neither of us had actually seen the 1988 movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit. I know what took us so long. <laughs> I feel like I had seen a couple of minutes out of context here and there when it was on TV. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this was a show that, or a movie rather, that I was very, very familiar with throughout, like, you said it came out in 87? 88. 88. So, like, throughout the 90s especially, it was on TV a lot. And I know a lot of people who had watched it and a lot of people who loved this movie. So, it was often just, like... On the TV, in the background, but I, I never sat down to actually watch it. Never once. It was also just an odd mix of live action and animation, and it was animation that featured old cartoon characters. And so I looked at it as a kid and was like, I, I don't think I'm interested in this. I didn't even know that there were old cartoon characters because I, I hadn't ever seen the clips that had like Dumbo and the brooms from Fantasia. That, that honestly, even though they didn't play a major role in the plot, that might have convinced me to watch it sooner had I known that. But all I really saw in a few clips here and there were like the titular Roger Rabbit, Jessica Rabbit, and then the baby that had a potty mouth and talked like... A, a chain smoker. Like, yes, exactly. And so like nothing appealed to me about any of those cartoons. And I will actually fully admit here that when this was on in the background in the 90s i think i think even throughout the 2000s it was pretty commonly on just like cable tv i had a little i don't know if i want to call it internalized misogyny but i saw jessica rabbit the way she was drawn and i was like this isn't a show for me oh how wrong i was and that is exactly what we're going to talk about today so for those of you who haven't seen it, we'll try to go through a bit of a description of the movie. As we just said, it is a mixture of live action and animation sort of blended together. Again, it was made in 88, so it was not particularly well blended together by these standards. <laughs> I did notice that the cartoons amongst real people looked so much better than the real people in the cartoon world. There were some times where their compositing of the two frames clipped pretty badly. Yeah, and I mean... I think it was probably pretty groundbreaking for the time to mix live action and animation the way that they did. But so not only is just like, and, and you know, we were both just talking about this when we put it on where so many shows and movies that we saw on cable TV or on VHS, the quality is so noticeably bad and so much worse than it is now, but I never know that until I see it again and then I'm like, oh yeah, this is bad. It's almost like my brain, when I'm thinking through scenes that I've seen before, like retroactively remasters it. Like in my head, the quality is better and newer than it actually was. So it still catches me off guard every time I watch something that is like older than, I don't know. 2005. <laughs> For me, it's always the, the old movie openings that used to be so common, but now I've, mm. I've forgotten them until they start up again and you hear that familiar sound mm -hmm. or see a, a logo or something like that. I think Disney still does that because they still have their like castle. They thing. do. I think that they've changed a little bit. I could be wrong, but there were also just for non like Disney franchise things. They were just common movie opening scenes. Oh yeah. I haven't seen the lion in a while. But anyway, this movie is set in Hollywood in 1947. It takes sort of a, I guess, would you say like a film noir sort of approach following a private detective? Oh, there are definitely elements of that because it's, it's definitely a whodunit 
Mm-hmm. It's definitely a like hardened detective who is has con- turned con- to drink. <laughs> is constantly drinking. There's a lot of smoking. Uh, that sort of atmosphere. The movie starts out, though, jumping right into an animated scene, fully animated, with some sort of older cartoon like Tom and Jerry sort of shenanigans. Oh, very Tom and Jerry. Where the titular Roger the Rabbit is tasked with looking after a baby while the baby's mom is out. And after a very quick series of violent accidents around the kitchen, a director yells cut, walks into the cartoon and the camera pans out and you realize that this is a set and the tunes that we saw, including the baby, are actors. Yes. And as I was watching this, since this was the first time I have seen that opening scene, it occurred to me that this could be a very clear influence for the video game Who's Your Daddy? Where one person plays a daddy and the other person plays the baby and you have to try to keep the baby alive. So that means if you're playing the baby, your job, the way you win is to kill the baby. Yes, it's a competitive game. And you can you can literally, as the baby, just like walk into the oven and <laughs> it's a horrible, but uh, I saw so many elements of that. Like, look at all the ways this baby could die right now and this rabbit is frantically scrambling around trying to keep the baby alive. But the baby's fine, because this is a cartoon. It's, it's the it's the rabbit that's getting all beat up by everything. Everything. <laughs> but yes, on the set of this film production, we're very quickly told that the this production company has been licensing, essentially, a number of working tunes. I believe they were licensed from Disney. And we get this view that in this world, tunes are real, but they're also sort of this exploited working class. Yeah, there's there's a bit of, um, I, I almost want to say racial segregation going on. Like, they have their own town where they all live, and they just come into the real world to work. Right, Toontown is separated by, like, a, I don't know, an interdimensional barrier in a tunnel. And the best part is they work for peanuts, says the slimy corporate executive who literally throws peanuts out the window at Dumbo. And now there's a live-action Dumbo. I haven't seen it, but boy, we we sure have come full circle, huh? (laughs) Getting into the plot of Little Bit In, we meet our protagonist, Eddie Valiant, who is a private detective who has previously worked with Toons before. I was under the impression that he is a detective detective and is just taking private jobs on the side because he needs money. Because he's got a boss who comes in at one point who, like slams a trash can down to wake him up and when a murder actually does take place he's got like come on we got a job to do and goes out with the team you asking that question made me realize that i don't know how detectives work (laughs) how did they work in the 40s in a world where half of the people are cartoons (laughs) he is billed as a private detective whatever that means whatever that means But his first task is to try to get some information on what's going on with Roger Rabbit, who is currently struggling with his acting work, and the idea is that there's something going on in his relationship with his wife, Jessica Rabbit. I love Jessica Rabbit. After watching the movie, I get it. I love her. I feel so bad that a younger Courtney saw this character and I was like, I don't want to watch that. But she does she does look very, very sexual. And so as an asexual person who doesn't enjoy consuming sexual media, I, I was kind of turned off. <laughs> but she is, I mean, she's amazing. She's definitely, like, if we're doing a, a film noir kind of a detective caper, like, she is the stand-in for a femme fatale character. But I would argue that she subverts it quite a bit. But the first time we see her, she's, I guess she's performing as kind of a burlesque performer because they call it the tune review. I think that's a fitting description for the performance. Yeah. Because yeah, she comes out and she just sings a song. But before that, it's definitely a variety show. Like they have like Donald and Daffy Duck. (laughs) Donald and Daffy Duck. (laughs) On dueling pianos. Dueling pianos. Where they're actually, like, cartoon blowing each other up. Which was hilarious. And then there were, there was not one but two hooks that come from offstage to pull them off. (laughs) 
was hilarious. Which, this is a good point to start to describe the differences between the real characters and the toon characters in this series. Because we see cartoon characters doing cartoon things all the time, like, they are basically immortal, like, virtually immortal. They yes. Get, they, they go through things, through situations that would easily kill a person, and so th they're kind of like these super-powered beings. Yeah, yeah, and... And it's not a case of, well, the cartoons can't really do any harm because we learn that our protagonist's brother was killed by a toon who dropped a piano on his head. Yes, which does kill humans, wouldn't kill a toon. But early on in the scene, as Eddie is going to this club. Yeah, club. The toon review. I, I think the club had a name that had paint in the name, maybe. Ink and paint? Ink and paint. But he asks for a drink and asks for a scotch on the rocks, and as the waiter is leaving, is immediately like, and I mean ice. <laughs> <laughs> and what he gets back is, again, the literal order of a scotch with, with rocks. rocks in it. Literal rocks. Because <laughs> tunes compulsively do things that are literal for fun. <laughs> yes. Like, to be funny. <laughs> they are, and, and this is actually, this isn't just a fun fact, this is important to our analysis about whether or not Jessica Rabbit is an asexual icon. The, the compulsive literality <laughs> of the cartoon characters is necessary. And that's the first we see, like, that is the setup. He gets a scotch with and stones in it. I think another important distinction, because you can step back and look at things like these in a couple of different ways. You could say, well, the writers were creating something that was intended to be consumed in a certain way or by a particular audience, so maybe they made decisions about the characters to coincide with that. But that's kind of irrelevant, because the world that they created is what it is, regardless of what their intent there. So yes. a lot of arguments about Jessica Rabbit is, well, this is a metaphor, and... The dunes don't do metaphor. <laughs> right, like, as an analysis of the <laughs> production process, of the writing process, sure, but in the world, this character was acting in this particular way. Yeah, and you know, someone working on the movie, Richard Williams, basically said, like, describing Jessica Rabbit as the ultimate male fantasy drawn by a cartoonist. So we know that visually that is what they were going for with her. And but they subvert that at every step of the way with the actual dialogue and the plot. Right, and I think part of that is that a person fantasizing about someone is a projection onto that person, not how they feel. Exactly. Which is, I mean, also a sort of parallels in the fact that a variety of actual actresses and, you know, famous Hollywood women throughout history sort of came together as a culmination of influence for Jessica Rabbit's appearance. And, like, I've heard Marilyn Monroe be thrown out as just, like, one of the most famous sex symbols in all of history, and it's like, we, we have had this conversation already. You can go back and listen to our Seven Year Itch episode if you haven't yet, but Marilyn Monroe was someone who had sex projected onto her by all of society, but she didn't get it. If you listen to her, if you see the things she's said and written, she was like, I don't know why people see me this way. So that's, I mean, the perfect parallel, in my opinion. But she is, I mean, she's got a very tiny waist, she's got hips, she's got a butt, she's got large breasts, which apparently people working on this film also don't actually know how breasts work and bra sizes. Because <laughs> I was trying to find just like quotes or interviews about the creation of Jessica Rabbit and what they were going for with her appearance. And it was, you know, Richard Williams, as I mentioned earlier, who was the animation supervisor and sort of spearheaded the look. But Peter Seaman, who was the screenwriter, this quote, I, I just had to laugh because anyone who knows how, how bra sizes work, um, and you can listen to our boobs episode for a nice explainer on that. He said, uh, we didn't write that she had 48 Ds or whatever. Correct. <laughs> because that would have been a very large band size. That would have been a, a very different figure. 
But yeah, and so they they got this animation. They were like, "Wow, okay, <laughs> so this is what we're working with." Got it. And her dress. I mean, oh, allow me to just comment on the physics of this dress because it is strapless. It is backless. You can see like a little bit of side boob action if you look at her from the right angle, and. I don't know how she's doing that because Mrs. Kisses bras weren't invented by then. Clearly, clearly she is wearing a Mrs. Kisses. There's there's just no other way. You you can't even like get that shape with just like body tape or anything because there's definitely something like supporting her breasts. So, any cosplayers out there thinking of doing this character, that's that's my advice to you. <laughs> But Jessica goes through this performance. The men in the audience are captivated. The detective ends up getting thrown out of the club, trying to sneak in and overhear some conversations, and ends up following a man around who we haven't talked about, who's mildly important here to the underlying plot, who is the head of the Acme Corporation. And he is not long for this world. But he meets up in a room with Jessica, and Eddie finds his way towards the window and is able to get a few pictures that are the evidence he's looking for. This is Jessica and Marvin Acme playing patty cake. And this is literally the children's game patty cake. Literally. And, like, he he's a zany guy. He's got all these, like, Acme products that are also things humans can buy that aren't necessarily, like, the anvil, but he has, like, the hand buzzers and little, like, jokes and gags, which we've already seen before this point, and so she's even like, all right, but take the hand buzzer off. <laughs> and th so, so many aloes watching this are like, this is a metaphor for sex. It is supposed to be interpreted as they are literally having sex right now. And the only reason why they don't actually show it is because it is a cartoon and because they want to keep it PG. But that is that is not the right analysis here. Because the, the human man who has his camera, who's he goes to the window expecting an affair, because that's what he's here to confirm, he looks in the window and he's like, you've got to be kidding me. After he just got served a literal scotch on the rocks, and he's so fed up with tunes that take things literally. <laughs> yeah, his whole personality right now is, I drink a lot and I hate fun. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So he's even like, you've got to be kidding me, and takes pictures of it. And we see these pictures of her literally like, patty cake, patty cake, baker's man. So we've got to get further into this character because we have to get to the bottom of this because I see the joke that's being made. I see that it is a tangentially sex-related joke, but it's also an intentional subversion. It's not supposed to be taken literally by us because the tunes are taking things literally. <laughs> right, and the the tunes have their own lives and their own relationships. And when Roger hears that Jessica is playing patty cake with someone, he is distraught. Distraught <laughs> Well, before we continue on, I have one other thing to note here. There was a line during Jessica's performance. Betty Boop is talking to Eddie. Mm-hmm. And Eddie is just kind of in awe of Jessica Rabbit right now and asks She's married to Roger Rabbit, and Betty Boop's response is, yeah, lucky girl. Mm -hmm. And that's just kind of showing that the standards or the dynamics of the human world and the toon world are not the same. Right, and that's part of the shock value when she comes out singing her song, because he also, someone named Jessica Rabbit, married to a literal rabbit, he assumes that she is also a rabbit. So he's like, oh, I'm here to see a rabbit. And then this beautiful human-like cartoon woman comes out and he's like, what? And and she's sexy and he's clearly sexually attracted to her also. So then you have all the like human aloe superficial gears turning where it's like, what is this bombshell like her doing with this goofy dude? And she does answer that question later. She says, he makes me laugh. Yes! And consistently throughout the show, laughter or comedy is like what the tunes hold like at the highest. Yes, it's so sweet. 
And like a big question is like, oh, is she cheating on him? Is she involved in this scandal? Is she at all involved? Because the, the next day after Roger is distraught and learns about this, the man who is playing patty cake with her ends up murdered. So thus, who framed Roger Rabbit? He didn't do it. So she's even kind of like a suspicious character for a while. Like, are you at all in on this? But she is so loyal and so faithful and so loving. And that's also kind of a subversion of the femme fatale, because most people think of that character archetype as someone who's going to use her looks and use her seduction to whatever end she desires. And that is definitively not Jessica Rabbit. We see people giving her attention and she's never like lapping it up. She's never like, yes, I love this or I'm using this. Which is relatable. Which I think that's a good segue into a couple of memorable lines from Jessica Rabbit. One of them I have written down is, you don't know how hard it is to be a woman who looks like this. Mm-hmm. And the detective is like, oh, well, you don't know how hard it is to be a guy looking at a woman who looks like you. Get, get out of here. I wanted her to slap him so badly. But instead of slapping him, she counters with the line, I'm not bad. I'm just drawn that way. That is the line. And that is what so many ace people have been talking about for years, saying this is relatable, this is other people imposing sexuality on her, despite her not wanting it, her not doing anything to feed into it. And it's honestly one of the most famous lines in, like, cinema history. I was seeing that it made... It didn't make the final list of, like, top 100 quotes, but it did make the list of 400 greatest movie quotes before they narrowed it down to the top 100 by the American Film Institute's, like, 100 years, 100 movie quotes. So that one, even outside of Ace Circles, even outside of this Ace Analysis, that is a big line. And I think it's so big because it is so subversive. And I think even allosexual people who still vehemently think that she is just this hypersexual being still can sense the subversion in it. And I don't know where the disconnect is. And even though that's the line, I mean, the scene does continue with more people just like fundamentally misunderstanding her just because of the way she looks, because then the... I assume girlfriend of the detective walks in and he has like just come out of the bathroom. So he's like in his boxer shorts and she thinks that there's like an affair going on and she gets all huffy and walks out. And we clearly saw that nothing happened. She just wants help finding her husband. So that that's the theme is people misunderstanding her, which is wild because... Before watching this movie, I I didn't know what we were going to find. If we were going to find things that confirmed suspicions that she could be ace, or if I was going to see something where I'm like, ah, eh, that's a stretch. So I've mostly held out on weighing in on the public discussion about whether or not Jessica Rabbit is asexual, but I see people floated around from time to time. And regardless of your takeaway, some of the things that Allos Online will say to attack any ace person who so much as suggests that she might be ace, have clearly been just wild, even not seeing the movie. So I'll occasionally be like, what a weird take. <laughs> and not too long ago, I, I literally saw this case. Jessica Rabbit cannot be asexual because she's married to a rabbit. And you know what they say about rabbits... So in this world, that is just straight up racial stereotyping? <laughs> I suppose, but what what a silly take. Yeah. Like, you see someone that you're sexually attracted to, and if you personally are not, you at least see things that large swaths of society would be sexually attracted to. Conventionally attractive, one might say. And, like, compulsory sexuality is so deeply ingrained in society that people will fight you on it 
in order to vehemently impose it on like literal cartoon characters. And if if the basis of your argument is she's married to a rabbit, like I can't think of a less sexual character than that rabbit. Like, and there are other sexual cartoons. I mean, let let's before let's put a pin in that for a second and let's talk about that baby. <laughs> I'm not a fan of that baby. By that baby, you mean the baby that we saw in the very opening that was acting alongside Roger Rabbit. Yes. The toon's name is Baby Herman. This is an adult toon that happens to look like a human baby. He's not a baby. He's just drawn like that. (laughs) But yeah, he is like, he is the cigar smoking, drinking, gutter mouth, like misogynist dude from the 40s who's got like, I guess she's not a secretary. She's almost like a stand-in nanny, like a woman who's pushing him around in a stroller and he's like calling her toots and slapping her ass, like just horrible, horrible character. And uh, to answer the question, because some people are like, well, you know, maybe no tunes have literal sex. Maybe they just don't do that. And therefore, these things that we are seeing, this patty cake is literally what sex is to them. And it's like, I don't think so, because this baby, like this detective's like, oh, you're quite the ladies man, huh? And he said, yeah, the problem is I got a 50-year-old lust and a three-year-old dinky. Like, ew, first of all, ew. (laughs) But now we know that Toons do have genitals, and at least that baby has a desire to use them. So, no, like, you you can't even make that argument that Patty Cake is sex to all tunes because they don't have human sex. That That's out the window. We're, we're throwing that out. But that is an argument I have heard before. And in fact, when I tweeted about this very silly take I saw at one point, that was a question someone had that was like, yeah, do tunes in that movie even have sex the way humans do? And pointing out, uh, as you stated, Royce, that playing patty cake with another man, Roger reacted as if he was being cheated on. He was absolutely distraught. That interaction is very um, isolated, though. It's not like you hear other tunes in the show being like, oh my god, she played patty cake with another man. It's something that is very isolated to their relationship. Plus, we've also seen Roger Rabbit overreact or do things at inappropriate times for the sole purpose of comedy. At one point, he... uh, uh, handcuffs himself to the detective. At one point, he kisses the detective on the mouth. Yes, well, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> he, he handcuffs himself to the detective, and he's and the detective's like, I don't have a key to that handcuff. First of all, why? Why do you have handcuffs in your apartment that you don't have keys to? So now they're stuck together, and of course, cartoonish shenanigans ensue, because... The the big bad guy who's trying to melt all of the tunes and kill them using this special dip concoction he made, which is the only thing that can kill a it's, tune. It's turpentine and some other things. Yeah, it's it's like literally just paint remover. Paint remover. <laughs> so they're after him. They're looking for him. And so now this detective's handcuffed to this fugitive and trying to hide him and trying to get uncuffed. So they go and he finds a saw to try to start sawing into the handcuff. And the table he's doing it on is kind of wobbly. So Roger Rabbit just takes his hand out of it and holds it still. (laughs) Like classic cartoon shenanigan. And he's like, are you telling me you could have gotten out of that at any point? And Roger was like, no, not at any point. Only when it was funny. (laughs) So... It could also be interpreted as this wild overreaction being something that he just did because it's funny. Because that seems to be the only way he operates. When they're in hiding, this guy comes in with all his, you know, all his weasels, literal weasels, because they're also car- they're cartoons, and this big vat of dip looking for Roger Rabbit. He's like, no tune can resist the old shave and haircut and he goes around just knocking and you just see Roger Rabbit just like like he knows he's very possibly going to die if he comes out and yells two bits to finish the gag but he just can't help himself because it's funny 
And that's why I wanted to lead into that a little bit earlier in the episode, because there is this compulsion that a lot of tunes feel, particularly Roger Rabbit as a performer, but many other tunes as well have this behavior that they just can't help but do, mm -hmm. oftentimes for comedy. I went into a bit of a deeper dive into the media here to see if I could find anything else about Jessica Rabbit. I couldn't really, because there's not a lot out there. She is sort of a secondary character to Roger and like the detective and some of the other ones. But in addition to the movie, first of all, the movie was based off of a book. The book is takes things in a different direction. It sets up the main characters, but has a different interpretation of it. And from what I understand, there was a second book made after the movie that sort of retcons the first book. So I feel like this is a case where the movie outshines the written material as oh, what yeah. people know and understand. Mm -hmm. After the movie came out, there were a few different comics. There's sort of a short, I guess you could say sequel, where the antagonist of the movie returns and you go through another plot arc pretty quickly. And then there are another two sets of comics, one of which is focused purely on Toontown and people going about their business in Toontown, and another one which is has a, a different detective character that comes in. But one of the stories in the comics has the villain trying to upset what's going in Toontown by degrading the animation quality of everything, like trying to cut costs and the, oh my God. <laughs> the tunes, they're like, we don't have the animation budget for you to do all these over-the-top acting things. You have to tone it down. Oh, no! <laughs> and Roger Rabbit can't follow direction and tone down his reactions, and he gets fired. Hilarious. <laughs> we don't have the budget. <laughs> well, this is who I am. <laughs> See, that? that's very good. But yeah, I mean, the thing is... People will be like, oh, well, she isn't supposed to be sexual, then why did she draw her that way? Like, if it wasn't supposed to be obvious that she's drawn that way but doesn't feel that way, why did they put that line in there? Uh, come on now, we can play this game both ways. But just as just a broader societal issue, because I, I am going to make the assertion that she is an ace icon. I, w I will say it. I, I will... I will... Slam the gavel! Ace icon! Ooh, that's so fun. Every time. Every time. Very fun. But it's it's so much less about the actual cartoon character and more just about how real people talk to real asexuals in this conversation. Because there are, despite some bigoted beliefs, there are asexual people that are very conventionally attractive, very much seen and viewed as sexy to broader society. And sometimes you'll get these, you know, silly hate comments like, oh, you're not asexual, you just can't get laid. Asexuals are just uh, ugly incels, uh, don't, got no bitches, or whatever. Whatever they're saying these days. <laughs> Great impression. <laughs> they got no hoes. <laughs> Right, but like we we know that's not true. We we have asexual models. We have Yasmin Benoit, accomplished ace model. I was signed to a modeling agency, and as soon as they wanted to put me in laundry, I'm like, I don't know if this is for me. Actually, I talked extensively in our boobs episode about what it was like being asexual with large breasts and a tiny waist, and all the issues that go with that. So. Anybody who is viewed as sexy, though, by these people will just say, like, well, you're not asexual because I'm sexually attracted to you. But that, that's, 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 that's not how any of this works. That is not how any of this works. Yeah, there's a long aloe history of straight women having to get over being attracted to gay men. I didn't expect you to take that in that direction. But yes, <laughs> I will take it. But yeah, if you're sexually attracted to someone and the feelings are not reciprocated, that's very much a you problem. That every situation that that happens, that is a you problem. That is not a then problem. Gotta figure out how to unlearn and unpack that there, bucko. So I just, cause let's, let's try to play devil's advocate for a moment because I genuinely, when I got this comment, I did not know where this person was coming from at all. And there was no explanation. So let's, let's try to see where they might've been coming from, if indeed we can. On Twitter, I got the comment, no, 
And th- this was in response to me saying that it's a very silly take to say that she can't be asexual because she's married to a rabbit. That was that was the tweet. And someone just said, no, describing her as asexual is to entirely miss the point of her character. Wh- what is the point of her character from this person's point of view? To appeal to your male gaze? That that's all I that's all I got. <laughs> that's <laughs> I mean that that was literally the reason she was drawn the way she was. But she's just drawn like that. Yeah. They told they told us that. That's not even subtext. <laughs> Cause yeah, even even as the stand in for a femme fatale, she's not using her looks to get her way. She is not cheating on her husband. The entire time that Roger Rabbit is out missing somewhere, really he's with the detective, but no one else knows that. She's looking for him because she's worried about his safety. So but what, where where is the prom, where's the promiscuity in that? Where is the cheating, the lies, the deception in that? It's it's not there, and throughout the other forms of media that I looked through, that's pretty much how her character comes in, is usually in the, oftentimes in the beginning or the end of a plot arc to help set up or resolve something, and she's usually present to give sort of a calm, collected, middle opinion or perspective between Roger and the detective. Yeah, because she's a little more grounded than a lot of the other tunes are, especially Roger, who's, like, way off the charts for zaniness. But she's still got some cartoon, like, behaviors. Oh, yeah, she definitely has hammer space abilities, as they're called. Oh, my gosh. We've got to talk about the hammer space. So that that phrase for anyone unfamiliar is like, think of any old school cartoon where someone just pulls out like a giant hammer out of a pocket or just like out of nowhere that couldn't possibly fit there. So that that's that trope. I thought Jessica Rabbit's version of that was hilarious because they ultimately... Well, and first of all, the way she saves Roger when she finally finds him knowing that she can't contain him because he's constantly self-sabotaging. He's constantly putting himself in danger for the sake of comedy. (laughs) She pulls a frying pan out of a tiny pouch, hits him over the head and throws him in a trunk. Yes. (laughs) She's like, well, I hit him with a frying pan and put him in his, in the trunk to protect him. (laughs) Hilarious. That is such a cartoon, ridiculous thing to do, but it was for a very grounded, rational reason. So she she's really funny in a subtle way. But, you know, near the climax of the movie, she is kidnapped with the detective. This big bad guy is threatening to, you know, not only dip them, but destroy all of Toontown. You know, class, classic evil guy shenanigans. And... One of these, like, weasel henchmen cartoons comes and, like, reaches down the front of her dress, down into, like, her cleavage. And he just, like, yelps in pain and pulls his hand out. And there is a freaking bear trap (laughs) clamped on his hand. And the detective turns to her and is like, nice booby trap. Oh my god, it's so good. It is so good. That was hilarious. And the fact that all of the boob jokes were not sexual boob jokes either. Like, their booby traps was funny. At one point, the detective, like, bends down to pick something up, and on his way up, he, like, hits his head on the bottom of her boobs as if it were, like, a shelf. Like, that old trope. Yeah, I think the actor that played the detective is, like, 5'4", five, 5'5". Five, five. Oh, really? <laughs> And so that that's really funny. That is, I don't think, aside from everyone's initial impressions of her, what they are projecting onto her, everything we see from her, everything we see, the way she is used, the things she does, the things she says, even the comedy that comes from her boobs is all very asexual comedy. Because honestly, hitting your head on someone's boobs like a shelf standing up, that's hilarious. <laughs> But yeah, and you know, everyone argues the patty cake line because aces will say it's literally patty cake and aloes will say that is a direct metaphor for sex. 
However, Rice, you did some further digging and you actually looked at some of the comics that came out after the movie. You looked at some of the like animated shorts that would roll like pre-movie in theaters. Yeah, in addition to the comics that were put out, there were three animated shorts. You can find them on YouTube, but they were the sorts of things that would roll in theaters before some other movie. And they were all, you know, 10 minutes long or so. And each of them was an acting scene. It was like kind of like the opening of this movie. It was where all of the cartoons were acting in some sort of movie in their world. And then at the end, they would they would cut or they would end scene and you would see, you know, them blending into the human world afterwards to leave work and go home or something like that. Mm hmm. And the one in particular that I think you're bringing up now is called Tummy Trouble. I think it was the first one that was put out. And at the end of this, as Roger's walking off the set, Jessica's back there waiting for them. Yeah, this this puts more perspective as to what patty cake actually means. Because as they're walking off set, Jessica Rabbit's like, oh, let's go home and play. And he's like, ah, oh, what are we going to play? Tiddlywinks? Canasta? Parcheesi? And she's like, how about patty cake? <laughs> it's like, they're they're just listing off games. They They are literally meaning let's play a game. It's great. I love it. Yeah, that does just give a bit more information about the the nature of their relationship. And the, the patty cake thing is brought up a few more times in the comics, too, just in a very similar way as to the movies, just be, as an, an ongoing gag, pretty much. Mm -hmm. But that was the main one that stood out because it put it in relation to other activities. First of all, canasta is just a hilarious one to throw in there. <laughs> that reminds me, I haven't played Parcheesi in years. I don't know if I know how to play either of those games. You don't know how to play Parcheesi? I think we have a Parcheesi board. I think maybe you showed me once and... Well, let's play Parcheesi tonight. Listen, folks. We are an ace couple who love to play games. <laughs> Video games, board games, tabletop, role-playing games, ace game, recognize ace game. And I do mean games literally. <laughs> I have been told on occasion that I take things too literally. So I I do identify as a as an accidentally sexy cartoon. <laughs> as they say, just drawn that way. But they really do have just a very sweet relationship. Like as silly as Roger is when they're together and the way they talk to each other, it's precious. Yeah, there was something that I started to notice more frequently when I was going through some of the comics. It may have happened in the movie, too, and maybe I just didn't see it for all the plot and other things going on. But when they were around each other, Roger had a lot of lines that reminded me a lot of Gomez and Morticia Adams. Interesting. Very different characters. Very different characters, but Jessica Rabbit and Morticia Adams have similar figure and similar mm -hmm. status. And Gomez and Roger are both sort of shorter and are both seen as being what society would perceive as less attractive. So that mm -hmm. dynamic is the same. Mm -hmm. But every time they would be separated for some reason, like Roger had stuff to do and Jessica needed to go to work or something like that, he would say some four or five line exaggerated thing like, I'll pine for your return, heart of my heart, light of my life, that sort of thing. Adorable. And that that's so interesting too, because Morticia Adams is obviously also seen as a sex symbol, but she does kind of own the sex symbol part. Like, a lot of her media actually is overtly sexual. But Gomez and Morticia have still kind of always been a subversion of the family sitcom because they're a husband and a wife who adore each other. And they have kids, and they are a loving family. And that was certainly not very common at the time, but it's it's still not very common to have very loving families. But the Adams family is sort of a different type of humor because they aren't going for laugh out loud funny. And some of it's a lot more drier, a little morbid, but it's still a husband and wife relationship where the comedy does not come from them being at each other's throats and hating each other. <laughs> 
which I think at this point is a very lazy way to go about writing. If you have a couple who hates each other and being mean to each other is is the joke, I guess. I've I've never found it all that funny, but you know, Jessica and Roger are kind of the same way. The joke isn't on them being a couple or them being a dysfunctional couple. The joke is on everyone else who judges them based on what they see right off the bat. Which is exactly the way we've always said that ace humor should be done when it comes to any sort of sex jokes, where the joke shouldn't be on, look at the person who's not having sex or isn't interested in sex. The joke should be on everyone else who's seeing sex everywhere where it is not. And we talked about how BoJack Horseman did that pretty successfully around Todd, where he was, during his asexual journey, like, the most healthy person going through the clearest path to, like, character development and personal growth, where everyone around him is just making horrible decisions in their sex lives. So, yeah, I suppose the the romantic comedy can kind of parallel the sexual comedy in that sense, where uh, jo- joke's on the other guys. So sin- since we sort of started, or Roy, since you started giving a plot overview, in case there's anyone out there who, like us, before last night, <laughs> had never seen it. Go ahead and round out how the story ends for us. And then I'm going to hit you with the the best ending line of Jessica Rabbit's, which I think further confirms Ace Icon. Okay, so you mentioned that they had been captured by the big bad who was trying to destroy all of the tunes, basically, including them and the detective. Which also, didn't you say that he's supposed to be, like, every cartoon villain ever? Yes, so the movie itself did not go into this fully, but the bad guy, who is known as Judge Doom, is a tune inside of a, like, rubber human body mask kind of thing. He's revealed that he's a tune at the end, but no more information is given. A comic was put out that is sort of a sequel where this tune is reprinted and comes back to life with all of his memories intact and tries to destroy Roger Rabbit and the detective again. And through that, we see his backstory. His name is Baron Von Rotten, first of all. Wonderful name. (laughs) And... He dates back to the early 20s and the silent cartoon era and got really good at changing his appearance and is basically every old-style cartoon villain ever. So he's like the black and white evil dude with a big mustache who ties up a damsel on the railroad tracks. That was one of the examples. It says that during Disney's political cartoon era, he was also casted to play Nazis. Oh, no. Not the cartoon Nazis, anything but that. But yes, he is thwarted, he is melted Wizard of Oz style, and that's basically the end of the movie. Do you know what that character villain kind of reminds me of? H.H. Holmes. (laughs) (laughs) A.K.A. Jack the Ripper. A.K.A. Every serial killer in all of history. (laughs) Okay, so... Context. <laughs> many, many years ago, we watched some kind of weird little trashy docu trashy docu series. <laughs> the docu part is in quotes. Remember, everyone, documentary is a film style. It says nothing about the authenticity or truth of the material. Truth. But basically, this person was a descendant of H.H. H. Holmes and was convinced that his ancestor was responsible for so many things that I would joke, I'd be like on my way home and <laughs> are, like, Courtney, are you ready to watch another episode of my great, great grandfather is every serial killer ever? And every time we talked about this in the house, it had a different title and got progressively more over the top. (laughs) I think it was actually called, like, American Ripper. Like, that's what it was. And it was this descendant of H.H. Holmes who was investigating H.H. Holmes. But then it started getting to the fact where they were like, what if H.H. Holmes wasn't actually executed? What if the grave is empty and he actually got away? What if he then went to England and became Jack the Ripper? (laughs) And And they were like, 
looking up all these aliases that he might have known and trying to find, like, boat records to see if any of his aliases were used to get to London. And so we were like... We were playing. We were playing that we were so invested in this and believing every moment of it. And we were like, I'll be damned. H.H. Holmes is Jack the Ripper. And, and, <laughs> and it went, did all the murders in, it was Chicago, right? Yeah. Then went to England, then came back to America and then fled from death and was responsible for more murders across the country. And yeah, we, we started uh, getting like so into it. We were like... I'll be damned, the guy was Lizzie Borden, too. <laughs> that was an example of what turned, what, what started as a curiosity watch very quickly turned into a comedy watch. Yes. So yeah, it was, my ancestor was every serial killer ever. <laughs> so that, that now we know it was all Baron Von Rotten the whole time. It's worth noting, too, talking about the climax of the movie and how they actually got out of this and succeeded and saved the day was also because of a very literal saying. So the scotch on the rocks, the patty cake, like those weren't just early examples that got dropped. This is a through line of the movie because, as you said earlier, this is, you know, hardened cop who's turned to drink like he... He hated fun, he hated cartoons, he had a grudge against all tunes because a tune killed his brother. But he ends up saving Jessica and Roger, who are tied up on a big death machine, controlled by all these cartoon weasels, by literally doing a song and a dance and knocking them dead. <laughs> and that, that's what they said, like, oh, you're killing them, you're, you're slaying them, you're knocking them dead. And they literally laugh themselves to death. Yeah, cartoon ghosts were rising out of their bodies. Yes! So that that is literally how they, they won the day. So we open the concept of cartoons with the literal scotch on the rocks. We see the main conflict begin with the patty cake being literal patty cake. And this is the resolution, is literally knocking the bad guys dead. <laughs> so it, it wasn't just a one-off gag. This is, dare I say, the point. That's a major theme. But listen, the real talk here. If you still do not believe me, that Jessica Rabbit is asexual. In fact, I'm going to say as much that uh, Roger Rabbit also is. I'm going to say they are also an asexual couple. I, I see it in them. I really do. And the final nail in the coffin, if you will. After everything's said and done, happy ending, Toon Town isn't in trouble anymore, etc., etc. Jessica Rabbit grabs Roger's hand and they start walking home. And she says, come on, let's go home. I'll bake you a carrot cake. That is the last thing she says. After a long day, after they were afraid for their lives, going to get murdered, going to lose their town, they just want to go home and eat some cake. And this all started with patty cake. I, I, I see it. Some, someone get me the red push pins and a cork board. See, now, now that's where my mind's going. Now that we're trying to figure out every serial killer ever, now I'm like, every ace... Nugget. It, it's all connected. <laughs> so before this goes too off the rails, I am saying once and for all, Jessica Rabbit is in fact an asexual icon. And I rest my case. <laughs>